Well, welcome everybody to tonight's uh, presentation on LP little a, assessing and treating a major source of atherosclerosis. Very excited about the amount of interest around this program and really appreciate you joining us. I'm Dr. Alan Brown. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at Rosalind Franklin School of Medicine and Science in Chicago and chief of cardiology at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, one of the advocate hospitals. I have the honor of moderating tonight and our esteemed lecturer, who is not only a great lipidologist, but a great friend, is Dr. James Trippi. Dr. Trippi is a cardiologist and lipidologist at Ascension St. Vincent Hospital in Indianapolis. He's currently the president of the Midwest chapter of the National Lipid Association and also the director of the apheresis unit at Ascension St. Vincent. This uh, program is a CME program. Opus Medicus designates this course for a maximum of one hour of AMA category one credits, as well as ABIM maintenance to certification points. So physicians should claim only the credit commensurate with the amount of time and extent of their participation in this activity. Once again, thank you all for joining us. And Dr. Trippi, take it away. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Alan, and welcome to everyone on this program about lipoprotein little a, a, assessing and treating a major source of atherosclerosis. I'm going to approach this in a rather clinical manner and talk about pathophysiology of lipoprotein little a, a discussion of ways to assess it and treat it, and then some case histories about lipoprotein little a treatment, and then a short discussion on the medications in development for the treatment of lipoprotein little a. Here are my disclosures. Lipoprotein little a, or LP little a, as it's called, is a particle in our circulation. It is uh, uh, demonstrated in the right lower quadrant here. Uh, it is an LDL-like particle. On the surface, the apolipoprotein B looks like a little orange ribbon on the outside surface of this particle. And it's attached by a disulfide bond to the apolipoprotein little a. That's the multicolored squiggly protein on the outside. The protein folds into these Kringle units and there are variable numbers of Kringle units that are related to the um, intensity and the number of uh, the uh, LP little a uh, measured in the circulation. This apolipoprotein little a is associated with increased intervascular thrombus, increased atherosclerosis and plaque formation, increased oxidation, increased aortic valve stenosis, and especially peripheral artery disease. All of these unfavorable cardiovascular outcomes are proportional to the level of lipoprotein little a as demonstrated in the UK database and Copenhagen city trials. And in fact, extremely high levels of LP little a are similar to the risk from heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. So that's about 26 times higher than baseline. The demographics of LP little a are fascinating. In the US, about 20% of patients have high lipoprotein little a. That is 20% of citizens. Um, and uh, Southeast Asian and those of African heritage tend to have a much higher uh, level as a group uh, with uh, high LP little a. So as a result, uh, LP little a is considered to be a cardiovascular risk multiplier or risk enhancer. Some people say lipoprotein little a is the single biggest source of atherosclerosis that is not adequately treated at this time. I saw this interesting paper just a few weeks ago in the Journal of American College of Cardiology by Bjornsson. Um, it talked about the atherogenicity of LP little a versus LDL cholesterol. Now we all know LDL cholesterol is a source of atherosclerosis, but this is comparing the atherogenicity of the, each particle. And it, it used a, a genome-wide associated study 
um, looking at clusters of LDL cholesterol patients and LP little a patients and their contribution to the apolipoprotein B. Now, I showed you the apolipoprotein B on the previous slide, but it's also measured and that um, when measured, it really measures the number of atherogenic particles in circulation. As a result, the atherogenicity of lipoprotein little a particles is 6.6 .6 times higher than LDL cholesterol. Imagine that. On a, this is on a per particle basis, but uh, understand also that there are many more LDL cholesterol particles than LPA particles, except possibly in these patients with extremely high LP little a levels, where often the LDL cholesterol is, is measured um, many of the LP little a particles. In general, there's quite a bit of um, uh, indecision as to how much uh, we need to reduce the LP little a to achieve a standard 20% cardiovascular risk reduction. Um, in this trial, they said as little as 32 milligrams per deciliter. You'll see that that is uh, different in other studies as we move along. On the right-hand panel, you'll see uh, the on the x-axis the genetic effect of um, these particles and the y-axis, the genetic effect of cardiovascular disease. The blue uh, line looks at the apolipoprotein B of LP little a particles as a much higher genetic risk than the LDL cholesterol. How is LP little a measured? Well, it's in the blood, so it's a blood study and it does not require fasting. There are two ways to measure LP little a. One is a concentration method and the label for that is milligrams per deciliter, normal being less than 30 milligrams per deciliter. A second way to measure LP little a is the mass measurement using uh, the label na uh, nanomoles per liter, um, normal being less than 75. So you can see they're very different measurements uh, looking at the same um, LP little a. The latter, the mass measurement, is tending to be the more favored measurement. And uh, unfortunately, you can't really convert one into the other accurately. It's estimated that um, one would multiply the milligram per deciliter number by 2.2 up to 2.6 to get the nanomoles per liter measurement. So you can understand how there can be considerable confusion from patients if they go to different laboratories. I've heard, oh my goodness, my LP little a dropped by two and a half times. It's a miracle. Or it got worse by two and a half times. Um, what's happening to me? Um, so I very strongly recommend that patients go to the same laboratory to have um, LP little a measures. Uh, uh, but I, in general, don't recommend routine or repeated LP little a measurements. This is often done when a family doctor or someone else recommends a repeat LP little a measurement. Very high LP little a levels are associated with those having fewer Kringle units or a shorter apolipoprotein little a, that little squiggly protein off the side of the little a particle, uh, off the uh, LDL-like particle. And then finally, LP little a levels generally remain constant throughout life and achieve the adult level at by age five. So really, um, there's no, or at least very limited utility in repeating the measurement of LP little a. So who do we measure um, uh, LP little a levels in? Certainly those with premature atheros atherosclerosis. And I certainly recommend uh, patients who have significant peripheral vascular disease have LP little a because it is so prominent um, in patients with PAD. Those who have a strong family history of premature heart disease or those who have high LDL cholesterol and more than two risk factors. Unfortunately, those who have high LDL cholesterol and LP little a often have very high uh, total risks. If a person has had angioplasty or bypass and there's a concern for restenosis or graft stenosis, they may be uh, um, good candidates for measuring LP little a. And finally, in Europe, at least, uh, the European guidelines are recommending that everybody at least have one LP little a measurement in a lifetime. 
Here's a little case history. Um, this is a 42-year-old male, a uh, non-smoker with chest pain. His mother had myocardial infarction at age 56. Um, his LDL cholesterol was mildly elevated at 113 when he was untreated. Otherwise, he's perfectly healthy. Uh, investigating his chest pain led to significant coronary artery disease being discovered and a four vessel coronary bypass grafting was performed. As a result of that, intense lipid lowering therapy with a high intensity statin uh, was used to lower the LDL down to 65. Unfortunately, he had recurrent chest pain just six months after bypass and a repeat catheterization showed two of his saphenous vein grafts were already occluded just months after uh, the surgery had been performed. At this point, an LP little a level of 457 uh, nanomoles per liter was uh, obtained. So very high LP little a as the probable culprit for his chest pain, significant coronary artery disease, and then occluded vein grafts. And uh, at this point, almost every patient says, is there anything you're gonna do to treat this? Um, I can't go on like this, uh, something must be done. And in fact, there's been quite a bit of futility surrounding LP little a because so many of the treatments are ineffective. Diet, lifestyle, and statins and azetamibe are in, ineffective in treating high LP little a. In fact, statins increase LP little a by 20 to 30%. Azetamibe only decreases LP little a by 15%. A recent uh, trial showed that one subgenotype of the LPA genome that codes for LP little a, um, when treated with the simple aspirin tablet of 81 milligrams, lowered major adverse cardiovascular events to 3.8 compared to those having a high genetic risk score of 11.4. And this occurred without any increased bleeding. So aspirin therapy for these patients with very high LPA little a may be considered as a therapy. Um, until recently, uh, measuring and obtaining information about this subgenotype was only available in a research environment. However, um, recent um, commercial laboratory studies are now available to check for this subgenotype. Uh, estrogen and niacin. The heart estrogen replacement trial um, uh, treated patients of uh, females with estrogen and reduced LP little a by 10 to 15%. Outcomes were improved uh, with estrogen therapy. However, it's, it's just not appropriate to supplement patients uh, with estrogen to reduce LP little a because of so many off target um, uh, effects of estrogen. So um, perhaps for those women who are receiving estrogen and coincidentally have a high LP little a level, they may achieve some small benefit from um, estrogen. Um, niacin decreases lipoprotein little a by 19 to 27%, and niacin decreases inflammation and improves endothelial function. However, in major trials, the AIM High and HPS2 Thrive trial, there was no significant improvement in outcomes in those patients with high LP little a and treated with niacin. Still, it's a somewhat controversial treatment. I've seen uh, experts say at least it's something to do. It has minimal um, uh, risks and perhaps a small minimal benefit as well. I don't know that that it justifies its use, um, but we'll leave it at that. PCSK9. Um, and outcomes. Uh, certainly PCSK9 has been shown to, uh, in multiple trials, reduce cardiovascular risk by 20 to 25%. That's a standard cardiovascular risk reduction. That's um, uh, a, uh, a standard for uh, achieving uh, a, uh, an indication for reducing risk. Um, it does so by decreasing uh, the LDL by 38 
uh, milligrams per deciliter uh, from an average of 104 down to 65. Um, Mendelian randomization um, of uh, uh, these trials suggested that it, you might have to reduce LP little a by 100 milligrams per deciliter, and PCSK9 only reduces LP little a by 25 to 30%. However, there's a very interesting uh, diagram in this paper by Schwartz. The upper panel are those patients having lower LDL cholesterol. And we can see on the x-axis, life protein little a, the y-axis, major adverse cardiovascular events. The blue wave shows that as LP little a increases, so do the major adverse cardiovascular events. The red wave are those patients who received alirocumab, a PCSK9 inhibitor. And notice that as LP little a increases, the waves diverge and the patients receiving LP little a had much lower cardiovascular events uh, than those who did not receive the PCSK9 inhibitor. So PCSK9s therefore may be a, a treatment for lipoprotein little a. And it's certainly a, a provocative uh, demonstration here. And then there was an abstract um, looking at uh, a, a subgroup analysis of the Odyssey outcome trial. And they said that one milligram reduction in LP little a re reduced uh, cardiovascular risk by 0.6%. Thus, just having to reduce LP little a by 35% um, may be equal to the same kind of risk reduction that occurs when reducing LDL cholesterol by 39. Unfortunately, this was only published in an abstract, and um, it is certainly complicated by PCSK9 reducing LP little a as well as LDL cholesterol. It's hard to separate the two. Um, at this point, um, I don't know if you have any comments here, Alan. Yeah, thanks for that very clear description of the pathophysiology and some of the data. A uh, couple comments. Number one, you did mention about the South Asians having a higher incidence of LP little a. And the audience members remember that. I think, you know, there are more than one issue that leads to people, South Asians, meaning Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, having three or fourfold increase in cardiovascular risk. Insulin resistance, but there's also very high prevalence of LP little a, something worth thinking about. The other issue is on the Odyssey outcomes analysis you showed uh, that in people who had elevated LP little a, uh, they got actually a greater benefit from PCSK9 inhibitors than those who had normal LP little a. And that goes to what I call Brown's law, which is the highest risk people always get the most benefit from anything that works, right? And if, <laughs> if you give aspirin to primary prevention, you don't get that much benefit. But if you give it to people who have cardiovascular disease, you get benefit. So it, it still appears that aggressive LDL lowering in those people at high risk due to LP little a, there's some fruit. And it was nice to see that because the prior the prior studies that suggested that were pretty small and not very convincing. Uh, and then I know that um, Vera Bittner did a very detailed analysis of those people who got both LDL lowering and LP little a lowering with PCSK9 inhibitors and in Odyssey outcomes. And it seemed like that additional drop, those who got a drop in LP little a also had some additional benefit. But as you rightly pointed out in the slide, that was a very complicated retrospective analysis. And uh, so, you know, looking forward to the new therapies that I know you're going to discuss it, uh, as we go forward. Right. Well, at this time, there is one approved therapy uh, by the FDA for high LP little a and progressive atherosclerosis, that being lipoprotein apheresis, literally mechanically removing these particles, LP little a particles from the circulation. This is appropriate for those patients who have had diet and maximally tolerated drug therapy for six months. They tend to be young patients with early and very progressive atherosclerotic disease. Lipoprotein apheresis lowers LP little a by 
60 to 75 percent immediately, and then a 35 percent time average median reduction in LP little a. The number four indication for lipoprotein um, apheresis are those patients with an LDL cholesterol over 100 and progressive cardiovascular disease and LP little a concentrations greater than 60 milligrams per deciliter. In Europe, uh, it was only necessary for patients to have LP little a's over 60 milligrams per deciliter to receive lipoprotein apheresis. There are numerous modalities in which lipoprotein apheresis can be performed. Previously, the HELP method and the DALI method had been used. Most recently, the dextran sulfate uh, absorber method has uh, uh, virtually taken over. Um, the uh, lipopack method is specific for LP little a, where the, uh, uh, the um, column that absorbs the uh, LP little a measurements are, have uh, antibodies that bind the LP little a. So that's only available in research though. Here's a schematic of how the dextran sulfate um, uh, process works. Uh, dextran sulfate is attached to cellulose beads in an absorption column. They have an intense negative charge that binds the very positive charge of the apolipoprotein B that's on the surface of, of all these atherogenic particles like VLDL, LDL, uh, and a life protein little a. Now, HDL does not have uh, an apolipoprotein B, and so that just sneaks right through the column and is not removed. Also, um, not shown here, but multiple pro-inflammatory agents are removed by this dextran sulfate, uh, including interleukin-6, uh, HSCRP, and oxidized phospholipids. Here's a little schematic of how this is done. Venous blood is withdrawn, goes through a plasma separator, and then the plasma is pumped through an absorption column. That's where uh, the uh, lipoproteins are attached to the dextran sulfate. The plasma removes, is, uh, is returned to the uh, patient after the lipoproteins have been removed. The Germans have the large largest experience in lipoprotein apheresis, and they are liberally uh, performed lipoprotein apheresis. Here's a, a common um, and familiar kind of analysis from the Germans. Uh, Rossler looked at 170 patients over five years. Uh, median age was 56. Almost all of them had coronary artery disease. They performed lipoprotein apheresis about every two weeks. Some of them uh, is, uh, frequently as 1.5 weeks, others at four uh, weeks. And 79% uh, of them, they use the peripheral venous access, just plain IVs. Um, and uh, lipoprotein uh, little a was uh, decreased from 100 to 28 milligrams per deciliter. LDL cholesterol dropped from 98 to 34 milligrams per deciliter with apheresis. There were no serious side effects that he described. This uh, these same kind of columns are seen in multiple studies. Uh, this uh, diagram on the left looks at major reverse cardiovascular events. The two main columns uh, to the far left are those uh, adverse events that occurred in the two years before initiating lipoprotein apheresis. The five little columns to the right are the number of adverse events that occurred after initiation of lipoprotein apheresis. You can see there's an 85% reduction in lipoprotein apheresis. And uh, the second diagram are all cardiovascular events, probably heart failure and arrhythmias are included there. And uh, there is an 81% reduction in averse events. They noted that the short uh, apolipoprotein little LAs tended to be those that had the highest level of lipoprotein, and uh, they had the fewest number of Kringle units. Just interesting uh, observation. Other German studies are very similar. Jaeger looked at 120 patients over five years, and they saw an 86% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. 
Rossler looked at 37 patients where they just were uh, performing apheresis for lipoprotein little a. And there he saw a 50% risk reduction for patients. Liebman looked at 170 patients with isolated LP little a elevation and uh, looked at the results of uh, lipoprotein apheresis and saw a, uh, uh, it's behind the, uh, the pictures here, uh, a, a significant reduction in lipoprotein little a. Uh, all these studies, however, are limited because there are no control studies. And it's really unethical to perform sham apheresis for long periods of time. So we're, we're just never going to have a, a, a placebo-controlled trial. Logistics for lipoprotein apheresis. Um, and uh, here, this treatment is recommended for those patients who um, have uncontrolled hyperlipidemia on, uh, and it's just a, a, a supplement to the other cholesterol-lowering therapies that they receive. Uh, there are limited availability of apheresis, only about 50 centers in the country, and it's uh, variably used in different countries. So certainly uh, some of the European countries are much more liberal. Other places never perform it. And realistically, PCSK9 inhibitors, lamidipide, and even acumab have decreased utilization of lipoprotein apheresis. And uh, just one more uh, slide and we'll take a little break. Um, peripheral uh, venous access uh, is, uh, is difficult for patients. Their arms are, are uh, tied down during the procedure. Um, even with fistulas in our unit, our uh, nurses are cross-trained for renal dialysis and they insisted that uh, fistulas be used. They would not use peripheral veins. Uh, we only did that for a short time until we switched and transitioned to everyone getting port access. Port access allows patients to have their arms free during the procedure. There's minimal discomfort. There's specialized needles for access, but these ports are only used for apheresis. Uh, and they have just an incredible um, uh, lifespan. Uh, the ports are good for a thousand uh, different treatments. After intervention, radiology implants them. It takes four weeks for them to mature. Um, and then uh, here is what the uh, port looks like. Any comments uh, at this point then, Alan? No, that was terrific. Um, I was sharing with you prior to the webcast uh, my experience, and I know you're going to talk about some of the newer therapies, but you know it's been sort of a mixed blessing that we have clinical trials for some of the newer drug therapies to lower alpha the way. And when I offer patients the opportunity for apheresis, where of course they would not have a chance of getting a placebo, uh, it, they seem to back out and they'd rather go for you know, uh, an infusion. So I actually wanted to hear your thoughts on how do you approach patients when you're offering them apheresis? Obviously, the the, uh, the data that you showed where patients served as their own control was very impressive in the German studies. And, you know, when they say, what does this entail? Uh, what's, what's, just give us an example of how you offer this to the patient and the types of things you say to them. Sure. Um, it, in general, I try not to candy coat this at all. Um, it is a major commitment on the patient's parts. But uh, um, as you'll see in a couple of these case studies, um, it's not a hard sell. I, most patients, um, when, when they really finally become candidates for this, it is the treatment of last resorts, and they are desperate. They, I, literally, they're begging off and to have something done, anything, because I can't keep doing this. Um, we try to make it easy by having the patient take a visit and talk to a patient while they're have, while the other person is having a treatment with apheresis and then um, allow them to make, um, make a decision without any pressure. Um, and so um, um, as, um, as we go on, I think uh, the two case histories will, will uh, allow us to understand how um, this um, can make a huge difference in, in a person's life when, um, when they really finally get to the point of saying, I can't keep going on like this. 
You know, I mean, these are clearly highly motivated patients. I know, as you're going to say, you show us on the case study. I actually got yelled at by one of our colleagues who you know well <laughs> that I shouldn't be putting anyone in a placebo controlled trial because uh, we're potentially leaving them to have significant events. And I've had that discussion with just about every patient that decided to enroll in the studies. But I will let you continue. Well, Thanks for your insight. Yeah, uh, and just um, uh, about uh, these, um, the patients who are receiving apheresis, I have not offered them to be in a trial because they they were so incredibly ill um, before apheresis. I, the idea of stopping it and then a 50% chance of taking a placebo was just untenable. Anyway, um, so advantage, advantages for lipoprotein apheresis, it, it can markedly improve a patient's functional capacity. Um, it, it certainly decreases angina pectoris, possibly by removing all these acute phase reactants and uh, pro-inflammatory agents, as well as the LDL and lipoprotein little a. Um, I believe it increases a person's lifespan. Why? Because I've seen in a few cases where for some reason, usually it's not a good reason, um, the uh, the uh, apheresis is discontinued. And after six months or so, um, patients have passed away or have had major and serious uh, complications when the LDL cholesterol or LP little a uh, zooms back to its previous baseline level. Um, and I am very encouraged by the use of these ports. Uh, patients have their arms free. They can um, read a book, play with their phone or iPad, et cetera. So it, it makes it much more tenable. And it's um, and all the complications with fistulas, um, we certainly know that from uh, dialysis patients are, are not an issue with, with that. Um, so apheresis is certainly suitable for those with extremely high LDL cholesterol, lipoprotein little a, and um, a renal situation, focal segmental glomerulonephritis. These are patients who have not responded to steroids, and by removing all these uh, pro-inflammatory agents, uh, they get better. And so it's a short um, uh, spell of apheresis, uh, usually over two or three months, and and the uh, uh, focal segmental glomerulonephritis improves, and uh, it all goes away. Um, there are disadvantages, and uh, again, not to, to candy coat this or soft pedal um, these. Uh, it's a difficult personal decision. Um, it requires a, um, a family to be committed and to have some support um, for this decision. Uh, patients can't be on an ACE inhibitor because um, angiotensin converting enzyme breaks down bradykinin, which is liberated by the apheresis. So all ACE inhibitors must be discontinued or all that bradykinin will cause um, significant hypotension. Um, there are no randomized clinical trials, um, and it's mostly anecdotal evidence about lipoprotein apheresis. It's invasive. There's some discomfort. It's not terrible. We use long-acting um, local anesthetics, um, and uh, that tends to minimize any um, uh, significant uh, discomfort. Um, there's lots of inconvenience. Um, and it may require travel uh, because these centers are geographically spread apart. Um, it can require significant travel time. Um, it, it interferes with work. It's difficult to maintain employment. And it's very costly. And it's hard to find nurses who can do this complicated procedure. So let's talk about um, a case history. This is a 41-year-old male. He had, uh, at age 41, a five-vessel bypass. Um, his LDL cholesterol was 72, great, but his LP little a was off the scale, greater than 600 nanomoles per liter. Um, he was on full, full medical therapy. However, he continued to have angina pectoris after his bypass. Um, and at that point, this was in 2017, we were able to begin uh, adding PCSK9. However, shortly thereafter, he... Um, developed statin-associated myalgia syndrome, some muscle aches and pains with rosuvastatin. So he stopped that. His renalazine was also stopped because of headaches and other constitution complaints. He was very anxious. And as it's, it's understandable at such a young age to be going through all of this. Um, anxious. And when we even recommended lipoprotein apheresis, he 
He had multiple, multiple discussions about this. He and his wife, they, he sought multiple second opinions, lots and lots of talking and consternation over this. Finally, two and a half years later, he uh, agreed to have lipoprotein apheresis because he was just miserable and felt poorly. Uh, ports were placed. His uh, first apheresis dropped the LP little a from six, greater than 600 to 300. Uh, two weeks later, it went back up to 509. He said he had some abdominal cramps with apheresis, then he'd have a bowel movement. Um, he said the day after apheresis, he was achy and a little bit fatigued. However, a year later, his angina markedly improved. He, the biggest complaint I could get out of him was uh, when he was doing intense bicycling, he was somewhat weak in the day after apheresis. So things were much better um, at that point. Um, he, what, uh, he started having slow flow through the ports and they he had to have a port study to remove a fibrin sheath. Um, a year later, his ports were inflamed and reddened uh, and, and particularly sore. We had an ID consult look at it. They said it was just a contaminant or some um, uh, inflammation at the site, not an inf infection. Uh, a year later, he had a rash after he received lipoprotein apheresis, possibly a serum reaction. Um, and then in uh, uh, this was um, uh, four years after beginning apheresis, he had unstable angina and uh, repeat catheterization showed his obtuse marginal one and two had a critical stenosis and he had two stents placed. Now, a month later, he had a recurrent unstable angina and um, a repeat catheterization uh, expecting to see more trouble showed no change. His stents were wide open and, and uh, the other graphs, et cetera, were wide open. Um, of interest, his um, lipoprotein little a before apheresis um, recently is 482 nanomoles per liter. After apheresis, it drops to only 106 nanomoles per liter, still very high. So you can understand how I believe we have improved his overall clinical situation, but it's not completely corrected, even with um, uh, apheresis. Um, here's a second case. Um, this is a 41-year-old female. She's an aeron aeronautical engineer, literally a rocket scientist. She um, had hyperlipidemia, was overweight, type 2 diabetes, but did not smoke, had normal blood pressure. She had angina pectoris, and in 2004, had a catheterization. Her first of five stents were placed, um, and, uh, and then um, in five years later, she had a lipid consult at that time. Her LP little a was 98 milligrams per deciliter, very high. And uh, a, a genetic um, variation was seen in her LP little a, I'm sorry, her LP a uh, genome um, uh, that is that codes for the LP little a uh, 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 protein. Um, at that point, then uh, she had increasing angina pectoris and a heart catheterization showed moderate non-obstructive three-vessel coronary artery disease and medical therapy was advised. Just a year and a month later, however, all her vessels were nearly closed off. She had five-vessel bypass, a young woman at age 52. In uh, <clears throat> a month later, her LDL cholesterol and super intense therapy, her LDL was down to 36. However, Three months after bypass, her left internal mammary artery was occluded. An attempt was made to open the uh, mammary, but it was complicated and was unsuccessful. In 2015, she had unstable angina. It was taking nitroglycerin every other day. She had chest pain whenever she had some fast heart rates, lying recumbent or with exertion. She was on uh, full medical therapy, including long-acting nitrates. With cardiac rehab, she had increasing chest pain. Um, it was worse if she ever forgot her isosorbide. Um, her work, um, she was working, but her exercise tolerance was decreasing. At that time, we recommended apheresis, and she uh, uh, wanted to think about it. Um, at that point, then um, uh, she was in 2015. We could not get PCS K9s approved because her LDL cholesterol was less than 70. Um, she had um, a repeat catheterization in 2016. At this time. Her left anterior descending artery was occluded and collateralized. Her mammary was occluded. 
her posterior descending artery was occluded, her left anterior descending um, uh, uh, was occluded, uh, uh, and uh, she had uh, was recommended for medical therapy. Um, she had continuing and worsening angina pectoris, work interruptions, finally full disability. She was depressed, desperate, emotional, in tears during every office visit. Her LP little a was 143. Again, apheresis was recommended. So she took a trip around the country and obtained second opinions everywhere to see if apheresis would be appropriate. And finally, uh, in uh, September of 18, she had her ports placed. Her pre-apheresis LP little a was 196. Um, and two weeks later, her LP little a dropped to 66 after apheresis. Two weeks later, it went back up to 176. However, in short order, her, C, her HSCRP dropped to 1.0. She had clinical improvement and increasing confidence. A year later, she had marked improved exercise ability, infrequent angina, and improved outlook. In fact, she took a sabbatical at Oxford. Um, however, in... Uh, uh, in twenty in uh, March of twenty one, she had two months of recurrent angina, and um, she did have a chronic total occlusion successful repair to the saphenous vein graft to the diagonal. Uh, at this point, she was able to do rehab. She was feeling well. She had some paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Um, she was not having any angina any longer. She had a little bit of dyspnea in the last few years. Uh, associated with an iron deficiency anemia that was corrected with iron infusion. Most uh, recently, her pre-apheresis LDL cholesterols are 22, and her LP little a before apheresis is 177. After apheresis, her LDL cholesterol is 2, and her LP little a is down to 60 nanomoles per liter, below normal. So I guess at this point, then um, we might uh, break and see if you have any comments, Alan. No, I don't think so. I think, you know, this is a couple of examples of what a disaster it can be to have really high LP little a. You know, I have a couple similar patients that were young, had acute events, closed their bypass grafts early, something that should be a red flag to double LP little egg, um, had persistent angina. And uh, those are the patients now that, you know, have been enrolled in the clinical trials with the medications that you're going to talk about next. Um, and I think LDLA, LP little A apheresis, LDLA apheresis is an excellent option for these patients. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that the cases you presented didn't magically suddenly become totally asymptomatic. I'm sure you've had several patients that actually did feel remarkably better. I, I think you told me you had six or eight patients. Um, maybe you could tell us about, you know, some of the other examples of the people who maybe had a little less complicated course and just your overall gut about the LPLA LDL, apheresis as a therapy. Well, uh at, at this point, I am telling people, I believe it'll just be a temporary um, treatment to get you to the point of when perhaps there are uh, medications that will be approved. Uh, so there's lots of conditions here um, to be met, but perhaps in the future, um, we can at least decrease the frequency of apheresis um, uh, for some of these folks and maybe as uh, we have in um, with PCS canines and um, some of these other agents uh, be able to um, uh, get them onto medical therapy. Uh, but uh, for for most of these patients, uh, the other folks, um, not nearly as um, uh, complicated medical history. And in general, they, they all come with multiple stents, uh, 10 or more stents, um, bypass grafting, stroke, and, and after apheresis, uh, it just all quiets down and 
and I see patients every six months or so in the office and hear about them when they're having their treatments and and um, and uh, and uh, on it goes. Anyway, medications. Uh, these are medications uh, on the horizon, um, and we'll talk about them and some of the um, uh, methods in which uh, we're able to reduce lipoprotein little a. First, the antisense oligonucleotides. Here, a complementary uh, strip of messenger RNA is injected, um, and uh, it binds to the messenger RNA for lipoprotein little a. And as a result, uh, the, the combination of the two is destroyed. Um, and apolipoprotein little a cannot be um, uh, transcribed and the protein cannot be manufactured. This process is uh, performed um, for, uh, or is used in the uh, pelicarsin. Pelicarsin is um, uh, a, an agent that um, is able to reduce lipoprotein little a. It is bound to um, N-acetylgalactoside, also called GALNAC. Uh, this is an agent that is incredibly and efficiently picked up by the acyalo uh, glycoprotein receptors on the liver. And so because it's so effi uh, efficiently um, taken up by the liver, uh, one needs a very small dose of the pelicarsin that's attached to it. In any case, here we have um, a phase one trial uh, with 112 patients. They received multiple doses and there were no significant uh, side effects with that. Uh, phase two trial uh, looked at um, uh, 286 patients uh, with uh, four different doses. Uh, there was an 80% average reduction in lipoprotein little a and a 95% 90, of patients were able to achieve an LDL cholesterol, I'm sorry, an, a lipoprotein little a cholesterol of uh, less than 25 milligrams per deciliter. There was some minor site reaction and no changes in platelets. There were no liver abnormalities, no renal abnormalities, or influenza-like symptoms. So, um, pelicarsin uh, in a phase three trial called the Horizon trial achieved full enrollment in July of 22 of uh, 7,680 patients. Um, this in this trial, 80 milligrams of subcutaneous pelicarsin is given monthly uh, versus a placebo and uh, the endpoint is the first major reverse cardiovascular event in, in the two different levels of lipoprotein little a. Um, it's estimated the trial will take 4.25 years and should be completed by 2026. The small interfering RNAases is, is, is a technique used for um, inclycerin, which is a PCSK9 um, a, a medication or inhibitor of PCSK9. In this um, uh, method, a small interfering RNA is um, uh, for lipoprotein little a is uh, injected and it binds to the RNA induced silencing complex, uh, which eventually leads to degradation of the target messenger RNA and a long acting um, reduction in the production and translation of the messenger RNA. So opacoran is the first agent uh, using that, also using the GALNAC conjugation to decrease the dose of uh, the medication administered. It was tested in a phase one trial in two sets of cohort, cohort, cohorts uh, with uh, uh, those patients having LP little a less than 200 or greater than 200. And in general, um, there was a reduction in LP little a from 61 to 96%. There were some minor adverse events, including uh, constitutional symptoms like headache and upper respiratory tract type uh, symptoms, infection symptoms. Uh, the phase two trial was performed on 281 patients, um, and there was a significant reduction in lipoprotein little a. And now the phase three Ocean A trial with 7,000 patients is estimated to be completed in December of 26. 
Uh, SLN 360 is an agent being tested out of uh, Germany. And I don't have a lot of details other than this phase one trial um, where there was a significant reduction in LP little a using multiple different doses. And finally, lipodisiran is a phase one, it, it, uh, completed a phase one trial. Uh, and uh, this is a long acting small interfering RNA uh, uh, combined with Galnac against LP little a. Five centers performed uh, trials and 48 patients uh, were, um, uh, were tested. Um, they did not have cardiovascular disease, but had elevated um, LP little a greater than 75 nanomoles per liter or 30 milligrams per deciliter and elevated LDL cholesterol. There was a 94% reduction in LP little a lasting 48 weeks, suggesting this might be a once a year injection. Phase two trials are underway. Finally, just to be complete, CRISPR technology um, edits or alters our DNA and it blanks out the LPA genome that codes for LP little a. Um, so theoretically, this is a once in a lifetime infusion. It's been tested in transgenic mice and non-human primates. There was a 94% reduction in LP little a at 224 days and it continues that ongoing study. It's not been tested in humans at this point that I'm aware of. So, Alan, do you want to do the summary? I hate to steal your thunder. Yeah, it was a beautiful presentation. Uh, I'll let you do the summary, and then I'll attack some of the questions. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> LP little a is a cardiovascular risk enhancer or risk multiplier beyond what we usually consider to be the big problem for atherosclerosis, LDL cholesterol. So, um, this uh, goes along as a, a cause for atherosclerosis as well as LDL cholesterol. Statins, acetamide, diet, lifestyle are ineffective in the treatment of lipoprotein little a. Aspirin and PCSK9 may improve lipoprotein A little a outcomes. Um, lipoprotein A phoresis definitely decreases angina and complications associated with very high LP little a and progressive atherosclerosis may be ameliorated by lipoprotein apheresis. And now we have new medications on the horizon that may significantly reduce LPA. We're awaiting their outcome trials and, uh, and how they will be used in the future. And this is how you will obtain your CME for the program. So Jim, thank you. That was very comprehensive. Just a couple comments, and then there are a few questions from the audience, and we have about seven or eight minutes to, to have you address those. Number one, even though statins and azetamide don't lower LP little a, there doesn't appear to be danger from putting someone on a statin with high LP little a. That doesn't seem to increase the risk. And going back many years, those people with high LP little a's who have aggressive LDL lowering have attenuation their risk that was shown in the Jupiter trial and then even back many years ago with some earlier smaller studies. And I think the Odyssey outcomes data that was presented uh, tonight, Jim, you know, also showed that getting the LDL very low uh, attenuates risk, but it does not alleviate the risk. And so I just don't want to steer people away from using statins and people who have elevated LP to the light, but you shouldn't fool yourself that you know, that's going to get rid of all. So we're definitely looking for ways to further eliminate risk, but getting the LDL very low is, is a reasonable starting point, especially if you don't have apheresis available to you and also if you are not participating in the clinical trials. So let me, there were a couple of questions that uh, I'd love to hear your answers on. One is, how are you, any clues about insurance reimbursement for apheresis? Uh, what types of things do you have to do to, to get it approved? Well, um, it is an expensive uh, procedure to perform, um, but it's life-saving, I believe, or it's certainly life-enhancing. Um, and so we um, are very, very careful in, in choosing our patients. Um, and um, if uh, you satisfy the insurance company's 
um, criteria in general because it's performed so infrequently. Um, insurance companies, when providing, when when you provide them a history like this, are are fairly um, responsive. And we've had only I can think of one patient recently um, who was told that it's an experimental therapy and the insurance company wouldn't cover it. Um, we're we're trying a different way to get that approved, however. That's encouraging. One of your disciples says, great lecture. You did talk about ACE inhibitors that needed to be stopped on apheresis. Is there an issue with angiotensin receptor blockers also? Um, well, <laughs> it's a yes and no. Um, um, ARBs um, um, do not um, uh, block angiotensin uh, converting enzymes. So theoretically, you can use them, but there's so much concern and the nurses are so concerned about hypotension, they won't let us use ARBs. So it's, uh, it's a nursing decision and we just go around that. Great, couple of additional questions that I could probably help answer. Does benpidoic acid change LP little a? The answer is no. That's been looked at pretty carefully and there are no meaningful changes in LP little a levels with benpidoic acid, even though it does lower HSCR and obviously lowers LDL. Um, there's a note here from a pediatric cardiologist who has a 12 year old with LDL of 138, no significant family history. They checked the LP little a and it's 478. And the, it, he didn't believe it, so he repeated it. It was 427. Doesn't say whether that was milligrams per deciliter or nanomoles per liter, but either one of those would be high. What would you, right. you suggest? I can tell you what I do, and then I'd be interested in what Jim says. So uh, at 12 years old, I would have a patient clinician shared decision making discussion about whether or not to start a statin on that young person with an LDL. 138. Uh, certainly safe to use statins in people 12 years old, and low doses will bring the LDL down quite a bit. And I would try and get the LDL down well below 100. And then what I would do is call that patient and consider when they're 30 to do a calcium score, honestly. I, I, uh, I, I don't know that I would do anything else. And if they chose not to do the statin, I would still encourage them to get a calcium score somewhere around 30 years old. Uh, I'm curious, Jim, what would you do? Well, uh, as I said, um, now we can determine the um, subgenotypes for LP little a, and a, a genetic test is is so readily available and and uh, mostly affordable these days and covered by insurance. I would check to see if um, this child has that um, a genetic subtype that responds to aspirin. Um, and if so, I, I believe a um, coated aspirin tablet, um, the risk is so minimal if taken with food in the morning, um, to minimize any peptic ulcer disease or gastritis, I think that should be reasonable. Yeah, I would just, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think there's still a lot to learn about healthy little egg. And uh, I think, I certainly see some patients who have elevated levels who have no sign of atherosclerosis at all. And even though in a large, broader population, uh, they, there's no question it's a risk predictor. Just as people with other cardiovascular risks about them have a zero calcium score. So I do think an adult in particular, uh, before you chase the number, you should make sure you assess to see do they have atherosclerosis or not. The cases Jim so beautifully presented were clear-cut secondary prevention in people who have declared themselves as progressive atherosclerosis. And then as we see whether some of the uh, new therapies reduce risk in patients with established CAD, we're going to have to tackle a much harder to prove situation about prevention, primary prevention in people with elevated LP little a. So those are my thoughts. Jim, do you want to have any final thoughts in the last minute or so think, that we uh, have? You um hit hit that um, hit the nail on the head, or we're we're right on target with this. Uh, 
you know, what we're trying to do here is not make pretty numbers. We're trying to prevent atherosclerosis. We're trying to prevent thrombosis. And I've seen children with these really, really high LP little a's develop um, uh, intravascular thrombus. Uh, one child thrombosed off his um, uh, small intestine. So um, that's what we're trying to prevent. So um, not to have, not to make beautiful numbers, but to prevent all the complications of this. So um, looking to see if there's early atherosclerosis is so important. Um, and then um, uh, checking perhaps uh, with a hematologist to see if there's uh, a, uh, a um, increased uh, thrombogenic risk is, is appropriate here as well. Well, once again, thank you to everybody for joining us. I see that we've hit our time at uh, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Really appreciate everybody joining us. Jim, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. And don't forget to go to opusmedicus.com slash CME slash 293 and uh, click on the exam and evaluation at your CME credits for this evening's presentation. Have a great evening, everybody.